Good evening, be present to the panel. And Madam Chair, I would like to direct my question to Ms. Asanta. Madam, you have said, please clarify me on this. I, I, it is a, a certain ambiguity occurred to me 
regarding your statement which executive uh, ratification of a treaty warrants judicial activism. Doesn't really contradict Article 4 and 37, 76 of the Constitution, Madam.
government in exile located in London, uh, from which uh, they could not govern their territory, but from where they could at least continue the war. Now, you could think in, in, in a case like this that the government of a particular state uh, that has to be sort of uh, effectuated on population, that from elsewhere it continues to govern if there is something left to govern in the sense of maritime uh, areas, so also that. But that, of course, can only happen if the state from where they continue to govern accepts this. So, for instance, if, populated, if the government of Tuvalu would be evacuated to uh, Auckland in New Zealand, that would be the New Zealand government to sort of give its consent to this. Um, the, and, and, and ultimately, you would think of a situation that this government continues to exercise sort of uh, to, to retain international legal personality um, which is we have one example the sovereign order of Malta the Knights of Malta who had to evacuate Malta uh, not because of sea level rise but because uh, uh, Napoleon uh, invaded Malta in the early 19th century and, and, and they uh, uh, they fled to Rome and from Rome continue to simply uh, uh, do as if they were still the sovereigns of Malta. And now we still have the international leader person called the Sovereign Order of Malta in a building in Rome where they sort of continue to have uh, uh, diplomatic exchanges with, with some countries. So, but that's a very particular feature. So I think this is all highly speculative. In theory, these things would happen more realistically I think uh, these states would be well in advance of the ultimate consequences of sea level rise, be taking legal measures in the sense of merging with other states to ensure that the, 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 the nationality, for instance, uh, and the entitlement to maritime areas are uh, safeguarded. Um, anyway, perhaps I could leave it with that. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think when we uh, look at the constitution as a whole, that we find the protecting the sovereignty of people is the underlying cornerstone of uh, the principles of the constitution. But uh, in certain occasions, we find uh, the sovereignty uh, of the state uh, has been used to uh, shield uh, the real protection of the sovereignty of people. So I don't deny the role of the executive and the legislature uh, have to play. So in terms of protecting the rights of the people. Uh, but sometimes we find those very uh, instruments of the state uh, sometimes deprive uh, or cause to deprive the rights of the people. And I mean, in certain occasions, say that the lethargy, that was the word that I used, the lethargy of the uh, executive branch or the legislative branch that undue delays in incorporating or receiving international law principles that will help to achieve justice for people. So if they, that is not happening, so there should be some alternative process to achieve justice for people. So judicial activism uh, can be invoked in those instances where people's rights are not uh, fully uh, uh, you know, achieved uh, by uh, the legislature and the uh, judiciary. We have to understand one thing, uh, you know, uh, sovereignty of states, uh, what does it really mean? Uh, it does not mean that uh, the state has the right uh, only to protect the state uh, arms. So if the uh, paramount, uh, uh, you know, obligation of the state should be to act as a responsible state and to make the people uh, uh, flourishing and their uh, human security is protected. So, if it is not happening, I mean, uh, tourism is used to block the rights of the people. So, I think in that event, uh, the judges uh, have an obligation to free from tourism towards monism. Perhaps it may not be in all the time, but where it is matter.
Good evening to the chair and the panel and my learned uh, friends. Uh, the question I have is uh, directed towards Mr. Paolo Fernando, sir. Uh, so the topic today is on global law and justice and uh, in the global environment. So we saw that the United States of America refused to um, sign the Paris Agreement recently. And it's a superpower. We all know that it's a superpower. So countries like that refusing to protect the environment, couldn't it affect the decisions? I know 195 countries did sign, but doesn't it politically affect other nations when protecting the global environment?
Mr. Palita Fernando. Sir, thank you very much for your constant support and encouragement. Mrs. Basant Vasanagaratna, Madam, your kind guidance has always been a great source of encouragement. <laughs> Professor A. Chesun, we are much grateful, sir, for your presence and contribution. Associate Professor Leanne Weisman, Madam, we owe you much for your kind cooperation. <laughs> Dr. Kalam Hussain Sir, many thanks for sharing your inspiring wealth of knowledge. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. But please remain on the stage. Uh, now I call upon Brigadier Idunin Ranasinghe, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Defense and Administration, to present a token of appreciation to the chairperson, Professor Kamina Munaratna. Madam, we are much grateful. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am.